Uh, so let me start with, with, in some respects, what, I, what is the obvious, right? Which is that our country faces uh, and is experiencing uh, what we would consider to be a pivotal decade, om almost a shock decade in a way. Um, you know, five years after the recession, uh, we still need to grow 10 million jobs in this country uh, to make up the jobs we lost during the downturn and keep pace with population growth. Uh, we've seen poverty and near poverty, or people living in poverty and near poverty, grow from 81 million in 2000 uh, to 107 million today. That's a quantum leap in a relatively short period of time. And so part of the premise of this book is that we really need to rethink the growth model for our country and, and move from a growth model that was characterized by consumption and debt to one that is really fueled by innovation and powered by advanced lower carbon energy and driven by exports and global engagement. And in a perfect world or in the world in which we think we live in the United States, the thinking is, well, we'll, we'll need a national government, right? A federal government to really set the rules so that we can make that kind of transition. And what we find, however, is, you know, like Elvis, the federal government has essentially left the building, right? Um, it, it, it is mired in a level of partisan rancor in ideological polarization that we've really never experienced in, in our lives. I mean, people say, well, maybe this is like parts of the mid or late 19th century, but in, in modern memory, we've never experienced anything like this. Um, what this book basically says is that, however, there is some very good news. You know, when we look across the country and when we travel across the country, what we see are cities and metropolitan areas uh, and the networks of not just government, but corporate, civic, university, labor, and environmental leaders who really co-govern and co-produce their economies, they're stepping up in the absence of federal leadership, and they're doing the hard work to grow jobs and make their economies more prosperous. They're investing in infrastructure, transit, freight, ports, airports, energy distribution, the list goes on and on. They're making manufacturing and production and the interplay of production and innovation a priority again. They're equipping workers with the education and skills they need, not just four-year degrees, but really high school plus, community colleges. Uh, what we used to call shop, what we used to call trades, what we used to call uh, vocational education, that's making a resurgence in our country. Uh, they're helping to integrate literally tens of millions of immigrants into the economic mainstream so they can become entrepreneurs and productive workers and productive citizens. Uh, and they are engaging the world. They, they are literally um, looking uh, outside of the United States where 95% of the consumers live today, and they're basically striking structured relationships with their trading partners, almost like the Silk Road or medieval Hanseatic League. So we see leaders uh, at the ground level across this country, and Jennifer can tell you some of the stories, who basically have absorbed the wake-up call of this recession. And, and they basically, are, with the powers that they have and the resources they have, beginning to set up a different path forward. And people, you know, ask us, well, how, you know, how can cities and metropolitan areas do this, right? Aren't we a country? I mean, we've been taught literally since elementary school. We're a country that's driven from the top, right? The president and the vice president and 535 members of Congress sitting at the top of our system sort of raining down rules and resources. Actually, the way we operate as an economy and society is through these networks of cities and metropolitan areas. There's 388 metropolitan areas in the United States. The top 100 alone sit on only one-eighth of our land mass. They're two-thirds of our population. They're three-quarters of our GDP. And on every single indicator and metric that drives modern economies, whether it's skilled workers, whether it's innovation, both ideas and production, whether it's infrastructure to move people and goods and energy and ideas, there's 75, 80, 85, 90 percent and above of the nation's share. So when we look at our country, 
what we see as a metropolitan nation, a very powerful metropolitan nation with rich assets, special attributes and advantages, and leadership. And essentially what we're experiencing today because of this shock of the Great Recession, and frankly because of the shock of a national government that is really missing in action, are these leaders who, who really power these places forward are understanding uh, that the cavalry is not coming. They are essentially on their own. And they're going to have to basically move the country forward. So when we look out over the next decade, um, we think what will principally happen, um, and again, you know, if the national government miraculously can get its act together and begin to act with deliberation and purpose, wonderful, right? But what we see happening in the United States is that change increasingly is going to happen and progress is increasingly going to happen in places where people live. And that the wave of innovation that we're basically capturing and chronicling in this book will basically spread across the United States, uh, will be replicated in other metropolitan areas, and then that's how the United States moves forward. So with that general overview, um, subtle, right? <laughs> subtle message, right? Um, let me turn it over to my partner in crime, Jennifer Bradley, to give you some of the very hopeful stories from this book. Uh, it means a lot to me to be here. When I first moved to Washington, uh, a rather surprisingly large number of years ago, I lived uh, at the Brandywine, and every weekend I would come up to politics and prose, and I would just sort of yearn to be part of the world of Washington that was so that came here, that spoke here. Uh, so it's a great honor uh, to be here, and I'm really, I'm really delighted that you all came out. The Metropolitan Revolution is playing out in different ways in different metropolitan areas across the country. And we think that's as it should be because every metropolitan area has a unique set of strengths and challenges. Portland and Phoenix don't have the same set of specialties. They don't have the same workforce. They don't have the same export profile. So every place is having to figure out for itself what the Metropolitan Revolution means and how they can bring it to life. So I want to quickly skip through three examples of the Metropolitan Revolution that we talk about in the book so people can understand the way this is taking shape across the country and maybe start envisioning the possibilities uh, for Washington, D.C. or other communities. In New York, uh, after the Great Recession, or during the Great Recession, the city understood that it was overly dependent on the financial sector. And they started to think about how they could diversify and get away from being so dependent on finance. The mayor and his economic development team understood, however, that all of the ideas about how to change the economy were not locked inside City Hall. They were actually out amongst the people who were you know, building businesses and living in neighborhoods. So they spoke to about 300 business leaders, several dozen community groups, and they went to them with a question. If there were no constraints, let your imagination run wild, if there were no constraints, what would you do to change the New York City economy and make it stronger? The overwhelming answer they got back was that New York City needed more advanced technical talent. They needed this tech talent both to you know, build on the burgeoning tech sector in New York, the so-called Silicon Alley, but also because the places in New York, the, the industries in New York, in addition to finance, that were strong and needed to stay strong, medicine, fashion, and media, were increasingly becoming tech companies. As one of the deputy mayors of New York likes to say, even Macy's is becoming a tech company with the advent of online shopping and more complicated inventory chains. So the city said, all right, we need more technology talent. The way they decided to uh, bring this technology talent to the city was they encouraged every university in the country, and in fact in the world, to compete to build a graduate campus, a graduate applied science and engineering campus. And again, the city took an approach that said, we're not the experts. We want you to tell us where you think it should be built, 
We want you to tell us what you think it should specialize in. We want you to describe a vision, and we'll see which one we like best. The city eventually, after this big international competition, selected Cornell and Technion University of Israel to build a graduate campus on Roosevelt Island. They liked that result so much that they decided to open it up and have a second and third graduate campus. And so the uh, NYU, in a consortium with other international universities, has a spot in downtown Brooklyn where they're creating the Center for Urban Science and Progress, or CUSP. And Columbia University has also made a big investment in a data technology center. It cost the city about 130 million total in infrastructure investments, mainly to prepare the Roosevelt Island site. They're going to get back $2 billion in direct investment to build the campuses. Over the next 30 years, they expect to see about $33 billion in investment, 1,000 new companies, and tens of thousands of new jobs, you know, spin-offs, a whole new tech infrastructure. So that's one example of the metropolitan revolution. Uh, that, that's an example that's more city-led or government-led. But the important thing to know about metropolitan areas is that they're not governments, right? There's, there, are, there are only two or three genuine metropolitan governments in the United States. In most places, metropolitan areas are united by people, by commuting patterns, uh, by networks of business, civic, philanthropic leaders who make a conscious decision or don't, right, to work together to improve their place. So this, the Metropolitan Revolution can even work in places where the government uh, is not taking the lead. One of the places that we profile in the book also is Houston. In Houston, there is a hundred-year-old uh, network of settlement houses that's led by, uh, that was founded by Jim Baker's, uh, the sec former Secretary of State Jim Baker's grandmother. And for a hundred years, this settlement house called Neighborhood Centers, Inc. has been welcoming new Houstonians and saying, we understand that you're here to work and we want you to come here and help us make a stronger Houston. By approaching immigrants with open arms rather than a please go away sign, by talking to them as if they actually bring something to the community instead of saying, you're poor, you don't speak English, you live in high crime neighborhoods, we don't know what to do with your kids, they have created a strong and robust immigrant community and in turn that community is able to get linked into mainstream health care, mainstream banking, uh, charter schools for their kid and kids and they're able to make the contribution that they seek to make to the city of Houston. Because of certain tax preparation uh, services that this network of settlement houses operates, these immigrants bring $41 million in uh, tax refunds through EITC and child care tax credit refunds to the economy of Houston every year, in addition to the economic benefits that they generate just by being there and working. That's another example of the Metropolitan Revolution because it is working through this network. There's the settlement house. There are all the institutions that it partners with, the, the institutions that actually provide the health care, that uh, run the schools. The, and these networks of leaders also work throughout the metropolitan area because one of the things that we've learned through uh, our research is that the, the immigration and poverty are not just city problems, they're metropolitan problems. They are happening throughout the metropolitan area, so you need networks of metropolitan institutions to deal with them. The final story is about Detroit. In our book, we celebrate Detroit as an example of the Metropolitan Revolution. And even though Detroit, the city of Detroit declared bankruptcy on Thursday afternoon, we still believe that Detroit is a great example of the Metropolitan Revolution. For one thing, it proves our point that the federal government is not riding to the rescue. There are things that we believe the federal government absolutely should do for Detroit. Uh, we wrote about them in an op-ed that's on the Brookings website. But Detro the solution to the Detroit fiscal crisis is largely going to emerge from growth because of assets and opportunities that are located in Detroit itself. We talk about an emerging innovation district in the city of Detroit. Most people think of Detroit as this vast space of emptiness and ruin and decay, 
And it's true that the city's population has shrunk so much that there are large swaths of the city that are mostly depopulated, beset with abandonment, 70,000 abandoned properties. But in a fairly compact area of downtown and stretching out into midtown, there is an incredible density of private investment and innovative institutions like the Henry Ford Medical Center, the College of Creative Studies, the Tech Town Business Incubator. In downtown, uh, the Quicken Loans founder and billionaire Dan Gilbert has invested about a billion dollars in buying up and renovating properties to rent to new emerging tech companies, companies that understand that there are benefits to their employees to being in an exciting downtown environment where they can interact with people from other companies, where they can learn from people in other companies. The M1 rail line is about to start construction, and that's going to be sort of the circulatory system of this emerging innovation district in downtown and midtown. If you go to downtown and midtown today, and Bruce and I were in the city earlier this week, you get a sense of incredible energy and optimism. Uh, the rental vacancy rates are about 2 or 3 percent in this swath of the city. People want to be there. The, in the uh, innovative institutions that I mentioned before are embarking on hundreds of millions of dollars of investments in their physical plant or expansion. We think that this, I mean, a Whole Foods just opened up uh, a few months ago in this area, right? We think that in this, in this core, this is where Detroit's revival, this is where Detroit's growth strategy will, will come together because this is the place that's marrying innovative institutions with people who are eager to work, people who are able to translate the ideas and innovations that are happening in Wayne State University at Detroit Medical Center into actual commercialized products. This is where you have a workforce that knows how to make things. Manufacturing is not dead in the United States, and it's not dead in Detroit. It's different. It's not 10,000 people in a giant factory. It's a few hundred people in small batch manufacturing, but it still exists. So this is an example, again, of how the Metropolitan Revolution, backed by uh, philanthropists like the Kresge Foundation and uh, the Next Economy Initiative of Southeast Michigan and others, uh, you know, charismatic business leaders, groups like the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, uh, community development corporations, can create and sustain an oasis of growth in a city that's spreading even when the city itself is in turmoil and bankruptcy. Uh, so I wanted to put the Detroit uh, example out there. I know everybody is probably thinking about that. And Bruce and I look forward to uh, your questions and an opportunity to engage more on uh, the book and the ideas in it. Um, well, thank you for um, the cities you've outlined. It's very fascinating. Um, I'm from the forgotten part of New York State. And um, part? upstate, all of it. Oh. <laughs> um, but <laughs> where are you from well, specifically? I'm from e Utica, Rome. Oh, sure. yeah. So. If you drive through New York State, what you see is city after city after city that is crumbling into dust. So w what interested me about your, um, your discussion was that you focused on large cities. I haven't read the book yet, but what do you say to small cities that have been struggling for generations? One of the things that we find really encouraging about the smaller cities, and, and this is actually one of the stories in our book, uh, we talk about a community of four metropolitan areas in Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. Cleveland, which is you know a big place, is at the center. But Cleveland has understood uh, that its future is interlinked with its much smaller neighbors of Akron, Canton, and Youngstown. And so philanthropies in these communities got together and said, we are weak individually, again, in the global economy and, and competitively, but together we are really strong. And so I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, these philanthropies from these four metropolitan areas have learned how to pool their resources to support an economic turnaround in that region of the country. And one of the biggest victories they've had to date is winning one of the National Manufacturing Innovation Labs for Youngstown, right, which is small, uh, often overlooked and, and left behind. So we think th that the 
the the way the metropolitan revolution will probably play out in smaller metropolitan areas is certainly them understanding that they need to compete as a metropolitan area, but they can probably link up with each other, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's not just Syracuse, but thinking about Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, mm -hmm. uh, Utica, and what, what, this, what that strip right on the northern border of New York really has to offer the rest of the world. The theme that runs throughout our book is this notion of collaborate to compete that the differences between places that have a common economy, uh, often a common history, a common set of assets, are much, uh, the, the differences between them are much less important than the similarities that link them. That's, that's how they're going to be able to grow and flourish. Yeah, I would just say, and I, what I love about upstate New York is it's all named after the Roman city right. and the Greek <laughs> cities, right? So. Um, this is really about uh, revaluing certain assets and certain economic functions that were overlooked in our rush to the consumption economy. We just finished some work for Governor Cuomo in Buffalo. Um, bigger city and bigger metropolis for sure than Utica and Rome and so forth. Um, but unbelievable assets. I mean, I don't know how many people in the audience have, have been to Buffalo, and the, but it's, it is a... Um, Allison, you don't care. Um, but it is, it is, it is a... It is a grand metro, right? Grover Cleveland, right? President of the late 19th century came from Buffalo. Um, and for a long time, my sense was there was no collaboration between the cities and the suburbs. Um, and there was no sense of how to leverage an enviable strategic location. You can fall out of your bed in downtown Buffalo and you're in Canada, right? Which you can also do in Detroit. Um, you have to swim a little, but it's, it rolls out. <laughs> Um, still a very vibrant, smaller, but vibrant manufacturing sector. Um, still a distinctive sectoral position, right? Um, which, again, when we think about economic development of, let's build another stadia, or let's extend our convention center, or let's build another white elephant edifice, um, then we shouldn't be surprised that our economies don't revive. That's part of the consumption mm -hmm. perspective of the world. When we focus on production, when we focus on innovation, you know, one thing I'll just, you know, throw out as a possibility for portions of upstate New York, I believe that whichever metro or series of metros basically declare to be the first no-carbon metropolis in the United States will have a first mover advantage. They'll be able to attract firms who make the sustainable products and provide the sustainable services, not for our economy, but for the rising economies of China, India, and Brazil. We have to stop thinking about the environmental objectives as purely environmental. They have huge economic benefits, as Copenhagen and Amsterdam and Curitiba in Brazil are finding. So that may be the future, right? It, it's it's. You know, it may be hidden in plain sight, but it's, 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 it's lifting our sights and our aspirations and saying, you know, we can through collaboration. And I think you've got a good governor in New York, frankly. I think you've got someone who can already through the economic development, regional economic development initiative coming behind cities and metros mm -hmm. in service, in support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you... you you talk about broadly how the, the federal government has left the building and the, the metropolitan areas <laughs> have kind of uh, filled the policy void. So I'm wondering if the uh, federal government uh, re-enters, what kind of lessons um, should be learned from your book uh, to change the way uh, that, that type of policy direction goes? And the second is, um, should, sh would someone be wrong to broadly consider some of these lessons as an argument for more local control? Uh, I think that more local control is happening de facto. Uh, cities and metropolitan areas, you know, we, we go to some places and they'll, uh, often not the people who are actually doing the things, but, um, you know, we get skeptical editorial boards and they say, well, you know, our state is so against us. You know, we've got this kind of tax environment and we've got this kind of thing, we've got that kind of thing. And our response is, yeah, you do. You also have to think about the assets that you have, and you can't wait for uh, change to happen. You know, for for every state legislature to suddenly see legislator, excuse me, to see things your way. Um, so, 
even in even in situations where metropolitan areas truly are hamstrung, they still have to move forward. And again, because metropolitan areas are not just governments, they're networks, you've got a philanthropic sector and a private sector that is not hampered necessarily, and, and community groups, the vitality of community groups, that are not necessarily caught up in that same, you know, home rule, local control battle. That said, we think that the, the smart states in the future are those that are going to recognize the power of their metropolitan areas uh, and take a page from Andrew Cuomo's book in New York, John Hickenlooper in Colorado, Bill Haslam in Tennessee, and uh, Hickenlooper and Haslam are former mayors, and figure out what they can do to increase the power of their, of their cities and metropolitan areas, whether that's tearing down artificial boundaries or rules. You know, in Ohio, we've done a lot of work in Ohio. Ohio had this rule that uh, every jurisdiction above a certain size and every county had to have its own coroner. Why? Right? I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. You imagine that, uh, that you could achieve certain economies of scale on that or, or other things. They will, the, the smart states will really understand that rules that were, th that were put in place for a different time and a different economy need to be rescinded and they need to let their metros flourish because in 47 out of 50 states, metropolitan areas are powering the economy, right? Even Detroit, after all these years of decline, if you look at not the city, but the city and its surrounding suburbs, the metro area, it's 47% of Michigan's GDP. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of startling statistic. In a, in a lot of states, it's just one metro, the biggest metro, that really powers the economy. So again, states, states will learn to get behind. Uh, Bruce is so eloquent on the subject of the federal government that I'm gonna let him speak to that. Well, I went to law school and I never practiced, and uh, I was in the federal government for 10 years, so I'm a recovering federal <laughs> official. So um, here's my view on the national government. It should do less better. Right? It should start by doing what cities and metropolitan areas cannot do. We're not going to have cities and metropolitan areas s make sure our food supply is safe. We're n you know, we need a common market. We need common environmental rules, particularly as we move and try to grapple with climate change. We're not going to have cities and metropolitan areas strike their own trade deals with China, though they will have trade missions to China. Um, and we need a social safety net in this country. Absolutely. Medicare, Medicaid, the earned income credit, child refundable credit. Um, unfortunately, you know, welfare moved to a block grant to the states and we're not providing enough of a, of a platform, of a foundation for people, particularly during the recession, who find themselves out of work. Um, there's threats to nutrition assistance, foods, you know, food stamps, what we used to call food stamps, which really has to be a national responsibility. These are the things that you need a national government to do. On everything else that matters to American competitiveness, frankly, cities and metros are really the main financiers on pre-K, education and skill, um, you know, K through 12, community colleges, higher ed, infrastructure. When you look at how we actually fund those things in the United States, they're primarily from the local and metropolitan and state level. So we, we need to have a clear-eyed sense of how our system actually works in this country. Uh, the national government is very important. It should be a reliable, stable, and, and a critical partner. It is not. But w that should not basically uh, you know, circumvent or undermine our ability to do grand things in this country. I was with the um, famous historian Kenneth Jackson in New York about two months ago, and I was on a panel describing, you know, this subtle message about the future of our country. And Kenneth Jackson listened to this and then basically said, that's how we built this country. We built our country city by city. We were at the Waldorf Astoria, and he basically said, if we go below the street level, and look at our subways, and look at our energy systems, and look at water sewer. Those were not built by the national government. They were built by city governments, in many cases, in collaboration with their states. We may be going back to a, a much more mixed form of a republic, 
which frankly I think will be more efficient and more effective because we'll begin to set priorities that are really customized to regional variation and regional advantage. So, you know, frankly, we're not like other countries, and that's what makes us special in many respects. That's what makes us more entrepreneurial. That gives us a default proposition when the national government goes on a major frolic and detour. So we should take this as a liberating moment, almost as an exhilarating moment, frankly, to set our own visions and set our own priorities and get about the business of moving the country forward. David Rusk, uh, well, Jennifer and Bruce, you know you don't have to sell metropolitanism to me. <laughs> I'd like to ask, though, a, a related question. In this country, we now have the most unequal distribution of income that we've had since the 1920s. Uh, in terms of the male distribution of income, we are in 71st place, tied with Ghana and Turkmenistan. And this takes, this takes a geographic dimension, because if you go census tract by census tract throughout our metropolitan areas, the level of economic polarization, that is the, the, where, the, where the poor live and where the wealthy live, where the affluent live, grows steadily deck by decade by decade, and in every metropolitan area, of over 350,000 people. The economic polarization has grown. Is this not a problem, or do you see things in your studies which suggest strategies for turning this around? Or is that fundamentally, in, in a lot of it, an issue of the national government? Well, first of all, for people in the audience, uh, this is David Rusk. Uh, he is uh, the former mayor of Albuquerque, uh, he's been a stalwart national leader on metropolitan thinking and action for decades. I just want to, yeah. Applauded yeah. an enormous amount. So a lot of, uh, so. you're building on uh, you know, the, the foundation that he's, that he's been laying for decades. So David, what I would just describe um, is obviously a central challenge to our country. It is the direct result of a misguided growth policy in this country that has taken place for decades. We, we willfully decided to go down the path of building a consumer economy and neglected, neglected what other economies have focused on, whether it's Germany, whether it's Holland, whether it's some other countries. Production, innovation, be at the vanguard of the, of the third revolution, which is the sustainable economy. Invest in education and skills that are not fanciful but customized to the production and innovation economy you have. So when you go down that path, you create jobs, but you create jobs that don't pay people sufficient wages and don't provide people sufficient benefits. We willfully decided to create that economy from the national level. And frankly, we still oversubsidize in our tax code investments in consumption and speculation and waste over the kind of production and innovation we've described. So I think the cities and metropolitan areas in the aftermath of the recession, because they're at the front lines of national distress and the kind of polarization that you describe, they get we were going down the wrong path and they are doing what is in their power to basically take us down a very different path. At the end of the day, politically what has to happen in this country is pragmatism and, and frankly, parochialism needs to trump partisanship. And there's some really interesting stories in the book where that's happening. And this notion of a different growth model needs to inform how the national government restructures itself. Because within the next 10 years, what's gonna happen in Washington, and this is just the math around the aging of our society, is we will spend about 1.4 to 1.6 trillion dollars more a year on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And what that will compel are some really, really hard choices about what our national government invests in. And I want, and Jennifer wants, city and metropolitan leaders to be at the front lines of saying, let's get a national government that does less better. 
that invest in the things that really can power us forward and builds on what we hope to be dozens of game-changing initiatives around this country. So if we leave it to the leadership in this town by themselves to sort all this out, I think we can all decide where that will head. If we lead it to networks, tens of thousands of smart city and metropolitan leaders to basically you know, paint a different path forward, we may find ourselves in a different place. And I'm not sure from a partisan perspective or an ideological perspective where that will head because frankly, when we go to states and cities, we're working with Republicans, we're working with, half the time we don't know who the hell anyone is, frankly. They're just doing about the business of making their places more prosperous and beginning to lower those gaps that you've described. The only way to do that is to have a different growth model for our country, and it's gonna happen from the ground up. Just to follow up on, on that very briefly, I th what, what we hope to see, one of the things that we hope uh, our book will create, uh, in addition to a lot of great uh, conversations like this one, is a sense among metropolitan leaders themselves, again, mayors, business leaders, university presidents, civic organizations, that they as a network can be very powerful and that there are things that they need to tell the federal government to get moving on because it matters to their economies and it matters to growth, right? Uh, Joe Stiglitz's book is at the front of the bookstore. It's a great study about how inequality uh, does, as you, as you point out, retard growth. We grow better if we grow together. The challenge is it's very hard for cities and metropolitan areas to take on the responsibility of a redistributive tax system, right? Because in an age of so much mobility, this is what's happened in Detroit. Detroit has had to raise its taxes and raise its taxes and raise its taxes, and people move just over the border uh, and you know, use these big, gorgeous highways that we've built to go in and out uh, and leave somebody else to pay for the problem. So the, the redistribution and safety net, we believe, is a federal responsibility. But we hope that metropolitan leaders will get together and go to the federal government and saying, you know another thing that you're, that you're doing to get in our way? You know another way that you're holding us back when we're trying to be the engines of growth is that you're, you're, you're leaving us with the bill for a population that needs more support than we can provide. So if you want to see growth, members of Congress, senators, federal officials, you have to get this right because we can supply the growth, but you have to supply, again, this, this, this safety net, this floor below which nobody can fall.